In our last episode of Exploring Jordan and Petra, we traveled through the Sig Canyon to the iconic treasury, and then up a pretty strenuous hike up to the high place of sacrifice. In today's episode, we're going to head down to a lesser traveled area called Wadi Farasa. There's a benefit. Nice. Look at that scene. Wow. <laughs> yeah, pretty awesome. Wow, look at that. Hey, oh, wow. Yes. This area is called Wadi Farasa East, and it's also known as the Garden Valley, which we'll describe later in the video. This is cool. But sometimes, because of the hard, strenuous hike to get there, it's also called the Hidden Valley of Petra. After you descend the countless numbers of Nabataean carved stairs, you reach a number of tombs, cult chambers, garden areas, and the amazing construction of the Nabataean water storage structures. When we got to the bottom of the cliff, we noticed that there was nobody around. We were literally the only people there. I just had to go see what was inside the first Nabataean carved room. This was called the cult chamber. Oh, neat. The reason this room is called the cult chamber is unknown. However, they believe that it was constructed in 248 BC. It has small arched niches on the two sides of the wall. The purpose of the chamber, which is today surrounded by beautifully patterned multicolored rock walls, is not known, but they do know that it was not a burial place. Sweet! Awesome. Look at the color up here. Yeah. This room was definitely a photogenic moment. All right, one more. This time we're going to jump. Oh, shoot. All right, on, on two, we'll jump. Okay. Two. Look <laughs> at that view when you come out. Across from the cult chamber is the garden triclinium. One idea is that this hall was used for annual feasts to honor the dead placed in the soldier's tomb. But a more recent belief is that it may have been part of What's a Nabataean water system or a dwelling for the cistern keepers. This thesis is supported by the fact that the stone wall next to the garden triclinium belonged to one of the largest water reserves in Petra. In either case, the hall is unique to Petra because it has carved decorations on the interior walls. The garden tomb and this triclinium were once linked by a colonnade <coughs> courtyard. As you continue down the canyon, you'll descend a few more steps and come to the tomb of the Roman soldier. Or actually, it's a Nabataean uh, soldier. So let's just call this the tomb of the soldier. The statue in the central niche represents the most revered deceased for whom common rituals of a group or clan were arranged. Oh, look, it's got even the bust is still on there. <laughs> on the statue. Wow. Whoa. Holy moly. Wow. The complex was built in the third quarter of the first century AD when Petra experienced the most extensive building activity. Inside the soldier's tomb are two distinct spaces. The first is a space with several niches carved in the wall, most likely for burial purposes. To the left, there is a doorway leading to a second space, an anti-chamber with bare walls. This is a reconstruction or a rendering that I found of what they believe the soldier's tomb once looked like. Directly across from the main facade is another triclinium. This space is much more ornately carved than the tomb structure itself. Along the walls of the triclinium, there are alternating columns and shallow alcoves, 
and in the middle of the room, there are the remains of a U-shaped triple bench, which in Roman society was used for sitting or reclining. Can you imagine reclining in a tomb of a soldier? I wonder why they, why they did that. Oh, the columns. You want to like, yeah. 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 all your like, I gotta get this, this in on film. Are you going in? Oh, no, no, no. No? Come on, tell me. Okay, can you hold that first? Okay, Anywhere. all your faces right should be like, okay, try to fit your faces in there. All right. Okay. As we near the end of exploring the area of Wadi Farasa, we start to wonder, why in the world did the Nabataean people build a civilization in a desert that barely gets any water? Well, after doing some research, I learned that in ancient times, trade was the wealth of the desert. So around 300 BC, the nomadic people of the area began to build the city of Petra strategically locating it in the only place caravans can travel from the, the desert of Saudi Arabia to Gaza and the Mediterranean Sea. As travelers passed through, the Nabataeans would require a toll tax and sell needed items to weary travelers, much like they do today. Even if you like to buy something, we will give you a discount in this shop. Yeah, really. I want some frankincense. What? Frankincense. As more and more travelers came through their area, wealth grew and eventually they wanted to show off their newfound wealth, especially to their neighbors in Egypt. So they began to build their elaborate city. But the only challenge they had to solve during that time was the lack of water and food. Keep in mind that travelers came from all over and much influences came from the outside world. Therefore, they were able to acquire the talents of engineers to build aqueducts, dams, cisterns. They even used gardens as bog filters and water basins as beautiful pools. By this well, or a water trough maybe? I don't know. But next to me is a little house, and then on the other side is the king's tomb, or soldier's tomb actually. So there's a little dwelling next to me, and then there's a water source. So I'm wondering how many people actually sat right here chit-chatting at the water cooler about the day's work or how their day went, or it's kind of amazing to just kind of sit here and wonder about the past and how many people fell in love in this spot or met new friends or got in a fight over a brawl or something. all in this one little spot. The possibilities are endless. So we finished up our first day in Petra at Wadi Farasa. On day two, we decided to head out to Little Petra, where you can take a hike all the way to the beautiful structure called the monastery. The Monastery Trail boasts to be one of the hardest trails to hike in the area. It's only a little over a mile and a half, but it claims that you have to travel over 800 steps. Now, I don't know if that's 800 steps up or down or both, but it was quite a remarkable trail, both in the skill level and in the scenic views. Straight cruising, headed for bruising, watching out for number one. You gotta slow down, look around you, son. Today is just today and not tomorrow.
and that is called the monastery. That's pretty amazing. I'm sorry, but that is way better than the treasury. It's huge. Watching my footing is important because it's so slippery here. Yeah. I'm afraid I need a walking stick. Yes, that's what they would be selling a lot of if they had I would walking, walking sticks. sticks. I would too. Instead of a pair of earrings. <laughs> of going from Little Petra to the treasury and it's like we're in a bazaar <laughs> with all the <laughs> there's been constant little shops all along the way <laughs> right here we're going to see some pillars here and then we're going to make a left and already be where we saw the amphitheater really so, yes so we're not that far Already, oh I would say like another 20 minute walk. Wow. Yeah. This was not hard at all. Well, unless you have bad knees. And there we were, soon after a half a day of exploring, we were back at where we were yesterday in Wadi Farasa. We decided to exit Petra the traditional way of the Bedouin by riding a camel. This had been my first time ever riding a camel, and I was a little nervous at first. Oh, 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 oh my gosh! <laughs> but the minute I got up on it, it was the most amazing experience ever. This concludes our episodes in Petra. In our next episode, we are going to travel even farther south down to Wadi Rum, a desert preserve in southern Jordan, where we will explore all over the desert on foot and by air. So join us on our next episode of Exploring Jordan. <laughs>